This is the Free Hill Life Podcast number 18. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we are here for another edition of the podcast. And I'm super psyched because today's episode is uh, kind of a result of doing this podcast in the first place. And I couldn't be more excited uh, to let you guys know more about that here in a minute. But uh, just a couple newsroom bits. Um, We're obviously still kind of closed down around the world, so there's not uh, a ton of skiing going on, some backcountry stuff, but we're still pumping away here um, on content at the Free Heel Life shop and also Telemark Skier Magazine. Uh, There's a new first look piece of the Majo 3.0 Telemark Tech binding that I put up and you can check that out on telemarkskier.com. I think you'll dig all the new changes with that. Uh, also during this time where a lot of people are kind of locked down, um, there's quite a few ways you can connect with us. One way I was thinking is suggest our Facebook group. If you are on Facebook under the Telemark Skier magazine page, and that's a great way to connect with Telemark skiers from around the world. Uh, also our YouTube page under Telemark Skier Magazine also has all, that's kind of a combination of all the free heel life, uh, shop videos, tech videos, along with all our gear reviews, um, full length Telemark movies and all that good stuff. So while you're sitting at home and practicing your social distancing, you can check all that stuff out. So today's episode, we're going to be talking with, uh, Keith Calhoun. And Keith is from uh, North Carolina and was part of the second wave of Telemark skiers in Crested Butte, Colorado in the late 1970s. Uh, He helped pioneer some of the early Telemark ski racing uh, during that time, as well as influence the equipment that was being used, like the Steinkamp style Telemark boots. We're going to get into a little bit about what, what that is. Uh, he currently lives back in North Carolina, about 15 minutes from the Cataloochee ski area and still Telemark skis today. And in fact, he still spends one month every winter in his own stomping grounds of Crested Butte, Colorado. So without further ado, welcome, Mr. Calhoun. <laughs> Thanks for uh, being here today. Hey, Josh. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing awesome, man. I'm so psyched that we got this together. And, and, and just for all the listeners out there, how this kind of came about is because of the podcast, I got this email from Keith and <laughs> said, I think you said you and your brother both listen. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. My brother's the one that turned me on to it. He's a telemarker also. <laughs> yeah, I love that. And yeah. And I get this, I think I, cause I'm always talking about all the history stuff and I get this email like, Hey, I was part of this early Crested Butte crew. And I was like, <laughs> no way. All right, cool. We gotta, we gotta make this happen. So uh, yeah, I'm psyched. I'm psyched to talk about it because you know I've just been sitting on all this for for the last uh, uh, almost forty years and just thinking, wow, did did that really happen to me? <laughs> no, but it did. It did. It was all. I was there. No, I love that man. Well, I I guess to kind of kick things off, like when you're obviously from North Carolina, um, where maybe tell us a little bit about where you grew up and kind of when you actually started skiing. Yeah. Sure. I, uh, I grew up uh, near a small town called Waynesville, North Carolina, which is about uh, 30 miles west of Asheville. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the county we live in, it has more peaks over 6,000 feet than any county uh, east of the Mississippi River. So we have some big, big mountains here. Uh, we just don't get quite enough snow to have big ski areas, but we do have a small one. And I grew up about 10 miles from there and didn't really start skiing until I was about, oh, 17, 16 or 17. Um, <clears throat> but kind of knew I was going to be a ski bum <laughs> right from the start. I got on the old National Ski Patrol, you know, because I couldn't afford to go skiing. So got on that and, you know, started skiing and eventually uh, knew I was going to have to move out west. So in the mid-70s, I, I moved out uh to uh, Summit County, and I was really into the mogul skiing scene. And in fact, I, I used to do some com- competing, some competition in moguls, and um, uh, that's that's how I wound up in Colorado. I had 
friend, I knew about Crested Butte since 1974, which was the first time I actually visited there. Uh, but I didn't end up staying there. Um, but I, I had friends that had moved there. So even though I was living up in Summit County working at Copper Mountain, I had all these friends already down in Crested Butte. So, uh, you know, I, I just was waiting for the opportunity to uh, move down there. And I, and I finally did in uh, early, very early 79. Yeah, so so you basically started. So you moved out from North Carolina, more more or less. To were you, was it because you were competing in moguls, or was it just like no, no? I I was into moguls here, and then you know I, we would take yearly springtime trips out to Colorado, and I just you know I was a mogul fanatic basically. <laughs> back in the Wayne, so, back in the Wayne Wong days. <laughs> yeah, a little bit after that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, Wayne Wong, Eddie Ferguson, uh, Jack Taylor up in Steamboat. Those guys um i didn't compete with them but um you know i wasn't that good but <laughs> yeah but i was I, I was into it but i i got kind of burnt out on the whole mogul scene and i was i was looking for something different you know and uh that's kind of how i got into telemarketing yeah so so basically was it uh i think when we were talking before you mentioned was it somebody's girlfriend that kind of first headed down to yeah. Crested Butte or something? Yeah, my uh, I have a friend who uh, grew up in Asheville, and uh, he and I were ski buddies back here before either of us ever moved out to Colorado. And um, uh, uh, he was on the U.S. freestyle team. He toured all over Europe and everything with the U.S. freestyle team. He was a bump specialist, too, so he was my old bump skiing partner. Uh, he moved to Crested Butte in, I think, uh, 75, and he had a girlfriend there um, <clears throat> named uh, Joyce uh, uh, Joyce Rossiter, I believe is her last name. And um, she, uh, uh, she was friends with a bunch of the actual true early pioneers of Telemark skiing in Crested Butte. And so I, I started going down to visit George in Crested Butte and, uh, and I met all these folks. Um, uh, they, uh, I can, I could list all their names for you. They, um, <laughs> they laughingly referred to themselves as the ski to die club. <laughs> and they were, <laughs> that seems optimistic, <laughs> <laughs> but that just kind of summed up their attitude. They were, they were crazy, you know, but great, great folks, but uh, they were all backcountry skiers who had taken to skiing on the mountain on their backcountry telemark gear. Uh, when, uh, the, the uh, you know, the back country was unsafe or the snow was crappy or whatever. So they started skiing on the mountain. And that's about the time that I met them through my friend George's girlfriend. And uh, some of, <clears throat> I can tell you some of their names if you'd like to hear them. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, well, there was one one crazy guy named Jack Marcial, uh, a fellow named Craig Hall, who still lives in Crested Butte to these days. And uh, we used to call him Hall of Fame because <laughs> he, <laughs> he, he, he was a truly epic skier. He, he was a great skier. There was a, a girl named Penelope Street, who was a former professional freestyle skier of moguls, actually. And she had got fed up with the mogul scene, or freestyle scene, and moved to Crested Butte and became a backcountry and telemark skier. Uh, Greg Dalby was another uh, guy who was a uh, early fellow instrumental, uh, Doug Bazell, um, those, and, and, and of course, Rick Borkovac, uh, ran the Crested Butte Nordic center back in those days. He wasn't really part of the ski to die club. He, he probably wouldn't have appreciated being associated with that bunch. <laughs> I'm just joking. That's, that's, what's, that's what's so cool about, I, I remember when you first, when we first talked on the phone, yeah, you know, the Crested Butte scene, why I was so stoked that you reached out was I, I on, the only name I've ever heard from that era was Rick Borkovac, yeah. Rick Borkovac. And, and, and it was funny because one of the articles you sent me made, it makes more sense because it sounded like when he was part of the, it looks like he was the director of Nordic Adventure Touring Center, right. <laughs> but that was That's like, right. <laughs> but that was like 1971. And so, yeah this whole other phase of this was kind of probably 
not remnants of it, but I'm sure some of those people kind of turned into these other things like the ski to die club and some of that yeah. influence. Yeah. Yeah. They, that <clears throat> the ski to die club, they weren't so much uh, Nordic like track skiers. They were, they were mostly just backcountry fanatics um, who, uh, you know, just started skiing at ski area on old Fisher Europa 99s. I think, uh, you know about those. Oh yeah. So. Oh yeah. That's, <laughs> that's what I started on, but, which, yeah, is, which is yep. funny because I always love when I talk to guys from your era and we both were on basically the, <laughs> the same gear only like yeah. 20 years later, yeah. 15 years yeah, later. That's hilarious. I couldn't believe it when you told me that uh, your dad had a pair of them. I know. So. Yeah, and he <laughs> still was, had a pair. And, and honestly, I lucked out because he was a mid. He was a guy from Missouri. He didn't even downhill ski. Wow. He just happened. Wow. We just happened to have metal edge skis. So yeah, aluminum edge. <laughs> Alu- aluminum edges. I still. Do you know why they did aluminum? I don't. I'm not sure. <laughs> I wonder if it, I'm not sure. I wonder if it was like a weight thing. Because what's strange yeah. is that they dent so easily that yeah. It's funny that they decided to yeah, use that. I, I, I couldn't tell you, Josh. Maybe to to, to make it easier to file the uh, birds out and hit rocks. I don't Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? I don't so know. like, so the ski to die club with all you guys. I mean, what? Maybe kind of help paint the picture of like what that. So this is in the late seventies, right? Or mid seventies? Well, this it was in the mid. Well, it was in seventy seven when I actually met those guys so i started that's when i started telemarking in 1977 and uh, they were already hard at it you know they'd been at it uh, for you know a couple of at least two two or three years in crested butte before i met them and um uh, uh let's see I, what i forgot what your question was <laughs> well maybe just kind of like paint a picture like um of what i don't even know if i said that but so we got kind of the time frame but i'm i'm curious yeah. to let people know what the equipment looked like when you yeah. first got there, like 1977. What, well, what does Kelly sure. gear look like? Most of these guys were still skiing those Europa 99s, those fishers. Yeah. Some, some were skiing the, the trucker ski company over in Aspen had started making skis by then, uh, with, uh, the idea of, of, uh, a light, backcountry ski that could also be used uh at the ski area they had steel edges and um that was my first pair of skis and uh the boots that everyone favored back at that time were galibiers um that was the only boot really available that gave you you know enough uh, support to uh you know, make the ski edge on harder snow. Mm. Um, Vask and maybe a couple other companies made some boots, but they're real flimsy, wimpy things, you know. Yeah. So, um, so really, people were skiing on Fisher Europas with snob bindings uh, and Galibier boots, and that was the hot setup when I first started. <laughs> <laughs> and the, was the snob binding one of the ones that had more like the wire toe? It was. Yeah, it had a great big old bale. Uh, we called it the bale. It had a you know a toe plate, yeah. which would fit the you know uh, it was a seventy five millimeter even back then, and uh, <clears throat> and it had kind of this uh, real long uh, wire, thick wire bale yep. that uh, it had a little separate hook that you screwed in you know about six inches ahead of the binding to that hooked over and held the bale down, which held that's what held your boot in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah I think I, th- I may have, I may have sent you a picture. Yeah, uh, of, of those, but uh, yeah, because um, I think the one but, I had the the Normark three pins on the Europas yeah. that I had. So that was uh yeah that that was a little bit later. Um, we started using later on. We start we we quit using the snobs and we started using a Normark plate with a Gates a bail <laughs> oh wow so you guys were already yeah. modding stuff out like oh, early yeah. early on absolutely absolutely and um i started um in order to give since the skis were so skinny in order to um make the boot be able to apply pressure to the edges over a little bit greater space than just what the toe plate itself allowed i was um screwing in these um like these bigger kind of fiberglass plates that would mount right behind the binding, which would give you a greater platform by which to apply pressure to the skis. So 
there was a lot of innovation going on. And of course, the boot innovation was probably the biggest thing. Yeah. And so, we're, well, I, so yeah, cause I, and I want to, yeah, I want to get into this boot thing. Was, was it, so in the, was it seventies or was it into the early eighties when you started actually doing the race stuff? Uh, that was in the late seventies. Oh, okay. Yeah. 79. Okay. When I started, when I started banging the bamboo. <laughs> I, I love, well, and was that kind of like out of the, I guess, where did the race thing start? Was that with you guys well, at Crested Butte? Yeah, it was. It um, um, they uh, <laughs> one winter um, I can't. There was a one one of those years, seventy nine or eighty, was a drought year, and um, there wasn't the skiery didn't open till late. So we started going up Cabler Pass up above Crested Butte, and uh, we uh, uh, first. I, I'm not really sure why, but we started setting up bamboo gates and running gates. Just there wasn't enough snow to backcountry ski, and this one little bowl that was up there, <laughs> we we called it the bong bowl. Or, uh, I'm, I'm not sh- I'm not sure. You're not why sure we why. That. <laughs> I'm not sure why we called it that, but that's what it was called. Never heard that in Crested Butte <laughs> ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so so we go up there and set gates. We drive up there because the road was still open. This this about 15 miles up above Crested Butte and we go up there and just ski all afternoon you know walk back up and, and we'd, we'd set up dual courses and r- race against each other you know it's just something fun and different to do and um that same year we kind of found out that there was an actual or it, it might have been the first year of the actual summit series uh race which i believe uh race series which was in colorado and i believe that was uh, started by it was uh, um Bob Kerfman was one of the guys that started that. And I believe Artie Burroughs probably um, was one of the original um, organizers of that series. So that um, gave us uh, a a big reason to want to run Gates, you know. And uh, like I say, that year, the backcountry skiing and skiing at the area was kind of crappy. So we just we spent all our time running Gates. Huh. Yeah. And so Art Burroughs... um I think you were the one that I didn't realize he started trucker. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure if Artie started trucker, um, but he was associated with uh, trucker early on. Okay. And uh, a guy named Al Burnham and um, um, Murray, uh, a guy named Murray, I think possibly Cunningham. Um, <clears throat> they started the company and then, um, uh, it was trucker for a few years. I still have a few of the old trucker skis hanging around here in my basement. Um, and then the uh, trucker, for some reason, they, they quit. They went bankrupt or whatever, and they reorganized it as the Phoenix Ski Company, uh, appropriate name. Yeah. And uh, Artie was uh, definitely uh, affiliated with that company. Yeah. And so, yeah, because our – Art was more part of the Aspen back then, or was he in Summit yeah, at that point? Yeah, yeah, All these guys lived in Aspen. That's where yep. the little ski factory was. Gotcha, gotcha. So you had like a little, you had, you had like the Crested Butte crew, then you had a little crew over in Aspen. You had a Summit yeah. Summit crew. And mm-hmm. I mean, was it was that, that must have been a cool time because you guys are like, you're doing this new <laughs> thing. And yeah. then these races probably were a way for you to get to know other telemark skiers well, and well, other absolutely. towns. It, absolutely. It, um, I'd say most, you know, a good, good many of the racers were from Crested Butte, but they're, you know, they were from all over Colorado really, because it was beginning to, you know, people all over the state were starting, uh, to get interested in telemark skiing. And, uh, so it was, it was a great way for us to get together with people from other er- other places and share, ideas and you know compare notes on what we were doing i mean um so yeah it was a little cross-cultural pollination going on there yeah yeah that's that's crazy i one of the things um i guess with the with the racing like is is that started because i know you did pretty well was that kind of early 80s mm-hmm. you were starting to win some of those <clears throat> races and stuff oh yeah well it, yeah i i always did pretty well in the summit series i uh you know i was usually um top five um out of about you know there'd usually be there'd usually be about 30 skiers show up for the racers yeah for, i mean for the races and um 
and I, I did pretty well from the start. Uh, my friends, um, Don Cook and Clifton Garland, um, uh, were, uh, were partners of mine and, and we raced a lot together and uh, the, most of the ski to die club, they weren't really into that. They, they, they uh, they did some racing, especially at Jack Marcial and Craig Hall did some too. Um, well, actually, all those guys did some, but um, but they they didn't really. Uh, it wasn't that their main focus was backcountry skiing still. So we kind of got real interested in this whole racing scene, and uh, you know we started studying alpine racing technique. And um, my friend Clifton Garland and I spent many lates late nights up uh, drinking beer and studying uh <laughs> books on <laughs> books on ski racing tech alpine ski racing technique and to see ways that we could um apply it to what we were doing and you know shave those precious seconds off their time wow and was that it worked too <laughs> oh i bet i mean yeah you gotta yeah you gotta look at the closest thing you can figure out and then you guys are like innovating on on the technique and um obviously that um kind of well did, so did that was that kind of like you guys studying you know how to shave seconds off i mean obviously you're mm-hmm. already modifying gear and whatnot mm-hmm. uh, tell maybe i think this is a good spot to kind of explain because this is to me one of the most uh important things is to is when you guys started modifying the boots and like what i, I can yeah, tell yeah. like bring it like how did that come about? You know, I can tell you all about the boots. <laughs> um, like I say, like I said before, Galibier was the boot um, that most people were using. One friend, Jack Marcial, was even using a pair of Nordic ski jumping boots. <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, yeah, because they had kind of high backs on them, but he was the only one that was using those. And um, so <clears throat> we began to look for some kind of alternative to the Glibier that would give better support and edge control. So, um, and I can't take credit for this, although I was there at the time, (laughs) my friend, Don Cook, who is still one of my absolute best friends to this day. And one of my regular ski buddies, when I go to Crested Butte, uh, I was just there the whole month of February this year. Um, Don came up, with the idea of taking an old alpine boots, you know, the old lace up alpine boots uh, from the fifties and sixties. And he found, um, you know, of course the soles are completely rigid on those boots and for telemarking, you needed to be able to bend the toe. So he took a pair of those boots down to the Gunnison shoe shop in, uh, uh, in down in Gunnison and a guy named John Boxley uh, ran the, the shop and he was a master cobbler and uh, Don proposed the idea of taking a Vibram sole, taking the stiff sole off of the boots and replacing it with a Vibram sole that would actually flex. And um, so John did it and um, they were amazing. So Don had the first pair of those boots. Uh, His brother, Steve, I uh, had the second pair and I had the third pair of those <laughs> boots. And so we were, we were sitting around one day talking about it. Now I, I will say one thing, they took forever to break in, as you can imagine. Well, they the, weren't just... <laughs> the, the toe, the toe on those yeah. old Alpine leather boots are like rock hard. They, <laughs> that's right. They weren't made to bend there, but we would employ all sorts of techniques to try to break them in, you know, break that leather down and get them bend in there. And we did, we were, able, we were successful. So we were down in Don's basement one day and one of us said, we were looking at the boots and one of us said, you know, those, these things look like Frankenstein shoes. And, and uh, Don said, yeah, Frankenstein comps and uh one of us uh, said well let's just call them Stein comps <laughs> oh my gosh. so that's how that name was invented anybody else that claims to have invented that name they're lying <laughs> <laughs> you guys are laying claim I like it well it's funny because we did it well yeah. that, that name I mean even in the first phone call that we had uh, you described the boot and I was like oh yeah Stein comps and 
Yeah, I right. I heard it from someone around here. Probably mm. um, there used to be an old race series here called the Wasatch yeah. Telemark series, and uh, I think it was some of those guys came into the shop and um, had mentioned well, we Stein knew, comps. Mm-hmm. And anyways, we knew some of those guys. We knew some of those guys. So you know that was part of the cross cultural thing I was talking about. You know they they said, man, these guys in Crash Tube are doing that. So there's no reason all you had to do is find a cobbler that was capable of doing it you know so yeah well and so the one thing that always pops up kind of pre because then you guys started riveting some sort of a plastic shell to the outside i started correct? you yeah, did i was the first one there to do go. that <clears throat> first one any in anybody in the summit telemark series i was the first one to Take. I was working at Donita's Cantina in Crested Butte at the time, uh, <laughs> Mexican restaurant. I took some of their kitchen buckets, big five-gallon white buckets, and I thought, well, <clears throat> there there was a product made for old early Alpine boots called Jet Sticks, and there they were these things that you could uh, stick onto the back of your Alpine boots, and it would raise the back of them. Huh. And, um, and, uh, yeah, they were called jet sticks. So I decided to make my own pair of jet sticks and I took some of those old buckets and I experimented around. And uh, at first I had them on the inside between the liner and the outside of the boot. And I would just bolt them on, you know, with, with screws and bolts. <laughs> and uh, then <laughs> I think the first, the first uh. iteration of it, I had them on the outside of the boot and then I went and put them on the inside and then I would take uh, foam um, just some kind of foam from a pillow or something and a lot of duct tape and I would pad them. And, uh, there's a picture of those boots in that cross country, uh, skier magazine, uh, that features, that talks all about that big race in Aspen. Oh yeah. No, that and, picture uh, is incredible. I'm going to make sure to post that picture because it's incredible. And it's the first, actually, that's the only picture I've ever seen of mm-hmm. that cuff and yeah we see we always call them pickle barrels that's what I always heard <laughs> well yeah that's 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 acceptable <laughs> okay well, so that's what's so funny to hear that you're the one that started that because literally for the last 20 years or so I heard about pickle barrels and yeah and it's funny that that's where it started. We finally well, got got to the bottom of it because I was always yeah, like, "How did they?" Yeah. But we could. <laughs> you know what's so funny is I never until I saw that picture that you sent, I never could imagine how you were like they actually didn't wrap around the the ankle as far as I thought they would because mm-hmm. later on there was a thing in the in the nineties called the Telly Cuff. There was actually a company that mm-hmm. made this like cuff looking thing, and it was like. Mm-hmm almost like a gator, like it wrapped around the back, but it had like a stirrup that went around the outside wow. of your leather, low cuff leather boot. But, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So that's where the, yeah. that's where the, it wasn't necessarily a pickle bucket, but it was well, a five, same, well, same pick, idea. Pickles came in them, you know, we, we, you know, any kind of, <clears throat> there's a, you know, you can go down to Lowe's today and, and buy the, the they're, sure. they're blue now. They're not white, but it's the same kind of plastic. You That's know? so funny. Uh, I sent you a picture of uh, uh, me holding uh, one of the boots, and that one has the, uh, the, the uh, plastic in between the liner and the shell of the boot. And then the one that was in the magazine, uh, like I say, was the first iteration of it. It had it uh, just bolted onto the outside. Man, that is wild. That's so cool to hear where that actually came from. <laughs> now, you know, there could be somebody else somewhere that did that at the same time, but I can tell you without a doubt of all the people in the Summit Series races, I, I definitely was the first one that did that. But, you know, I don't want to take too much credit for the Stein Comp boots because that was all pretty much the idea of my buddy Don Cook. He's pretty much the, the one that... Uh, came up with that idea and uh we uh, after that big race in aspen we actually met with a a, a representative of a solo boots mm-hmm. and he interviewed me and clifton garland for about an hour uh talking about our boots and we were so dumb we you know we just gave away all the secrets we, we were so naive at the time. We just told him everything we knew, you know. <laughs> and two years later, 
they came out with the Asolo Extreme Racer boot. Oh, man. I was just going to say, so they already had the Asolo Extreme out at that point, like a, the stiffer upper cuff. No, well, they, the Extreme came out first, and the, then the Extreme Racer, I believe, is the way it was. Yep. Because right after I moved back to North Carolina, I got a pair of the Extreme Racers. And so that was probably, that was probably 86 or something like that. But uh, That's so crazy. Yeah, and it's funny that, like when, when I was looking at that cross country article, um, that the pickle bear or the five gallon bucket, it almost looks like the Merrill super comp later on, which was, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, pretty much that's what it turned into mm-hmm. was you guys innovating on, on the cuff. And then they obviously made that into something later on, which is, yeah, that's absolutely. gotta be, that's gotta be crazy. Like to think back and you're like, here you are like modifying, <laughs> you know, your boots, just like with your buddy drinking beer, like, Hey, how do we race better? How do we get better edge control? And I mean, yep. it literally turned the course of, of how boots worked, you know? It absolutely did, Josh. I mean, they were, everybody was just skiing in, uh, you know, in Galiviers before that. And then all of a sudden we had this big sturdy wicked ass boot that you know you could really really edge the ski and with the addition of my plastic cuffs if you did get in the back seat you had a way to get back in the front seat you yeah know? it didn't throw it <laughs> well and that's see i think people don't um it's funny so we a way we initiate all our new guys at our shop here in salt lake is we make them ski uh pins and leather but, um, mm-hmm. we always make them ski low cuff boots and yeah, it's so perfect. funny. Cause here are all these 20 year old kids were like, it, and, <laughs> and the way we do it too, is we take, well, usually we take them to the top of the steepest run under a lift that we can do. You don't get a warm up run and we just like <laughs> let them go. And, and it, and it's, and it's amazing because people don't realize that the height of that cuff <laughs> is yeah. so different. Like the way you ski a low cuff like a solo uh-huh. or a Galibier is completely different when you've got a cuff that doesn't allow you to like extend yeah. your foot, your front leg forward, you yeah. know? Yeah. So you gotta be on top of them. <laughs> oh, hundred percent. And it makes, yeah, no, that's what's so crazy to think is like <laughs> that no one did that beforehand. Cause Galibiers are teeny. <laughs> I mean, I like, know it. <laughs> I can't even, yeah. Racing in those are no, that's no joke for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. so, so, so did, did you kind of start seeing other people adopt the whole boot mod pretty quick around the summit series? Yeah. 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 A lot of people started, uh, experimenting with their own, uh, um, with their own, uh, um, <clears throat> adaptations and, um, you know, but a, a lot really just skied the old boots, you know, without any, uh, kind of extension on the back, uh, um, and some of them did pretty well, you know, but, yeah. but, um, but you know, uh, it works for all the reasons it, you know, if it didn't, if it wasn't valid, then all modern Alpine boots would, would be no higher than the top of your ankle. You yeah, know? no, for sure. <laughs> when you, you even brought up, um, like before we got recording this, you were bringing up, um, old Steve Barnett who wrote cross <laughs> yeah. cross country downhill, which is the mm-hmm. book that I learned how to tell Mark ski from. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I know that's so funny. You said, Oh yeah. Do you know who Steve Barnett is? And I'm like, I <laughs> sure do. I learned how to <laughs> tell you from that book. And actually the book. Yeah. So the funny enough, I think the first edition came out like 78 or 79, which is the year mm-hmm. I was born. <laughs> yeah, right. right. But <laughs> that's hilarious. Maybe, maybe recount that story too, because. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, at Crested Butte, um, the race hill was a, it used to have a T bar. It's got a chair now, but it's at the bottom of the mountain. And it's, you know, it's where all the race practice goes on. And some of the smaller races are, are still held there to this day. That's where we would set up our courses. Um, you know, once once the ski area opened, we abandoned the bong bowl and we started skiing <laughs> at the, at the, uh, at the, the little race hill. And so one day we were, we've been up there running gates and off to the side, um, way out, uh, it wasn't really part of the ski area, but there was, uh, this big terrain jump and, um, it was formed by a little gully. And then the way the wind would blow, it kind of blow a little cornice 
And so we we pack that cornice down and we start way uphill and we ski down right up into the face of the cornice and then launch over the top of it, you know. So basically, instead of jumping off the cornice, we're skiing up the cornice. Um, and, um, and then, you know, you would launch <laughs> and, uh, and, and keep in mind, this is when we still had, uh, I was on Kazama skis that, that particular day. And, uh, so I, <clears throat> I, I went up and, um, I came down and hit it with some good speed and I, I threw a pretty big air 360 off of it and, um, landed it and i was standing there talking to some of my buddies and uh this guy came skiing down really fast and he got to us and he screeched to a stop and almost fell over and he was like dude dude man man did did you just do a 360 (laughs) off that jump (laughs) i said yeah yeah I, i did he said good god he said you're the first person I've ever seen do that on cross country skis. I said, "Really?" I said, "Well, welcome to Crested Butte." <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're like, "This is normal fare for around here, bro." <laughs> yeah. He, so he got to talking with us, and he introduced himself. He said, "I'm Steve Barnett. I I I wrote a book. Uh, you know, yada yada yada." And uh, and do you mind if I take some pictures? So he he took some pictures. You know, we went back up. We would just hike back up and jump it again, and and then you know I never saw him a- again after that. Uh, but uh, but that was my uh, one uh, uh, run in with Steve Barnett. <laughs> That's so interesting. Is I know, and and I'm not sure. I was trying to see if if Steve's still kicking up, and uh, he's he's from the Pacific Northwest, and uh, is he? Yeah. No, it'd be funny. Have you ever looked to see if any of those pictures ever came out in one of his books or something? I haven't. I, no, I should. I haven't. I've got an. I've got the <laughs> second or third edition. That'd be hilarious if there's actually cool. a photo of, of oh, you yeah. in there. But uh, there's a, there's another book written by a guy from Crested Butte uh, named Brad English, and he wrote a book called Total Telemarking. Um, have you ever seen that one? I just either ordered that i found that actually that's funny you brought that up because i had never heard about it and i saw it on ebay (laughs) yeah yeah brad english he was a good friend of mine and he was a telemarker and uh he wrote it's pretty it's actually a pretty good book on telemarking and um there's some pictures of me in that book um, actually (laughs) running gates as a matter of fact and it's kind of funny in the picture um uh, of me running running the gate, uh, I have on blue jeans, uh, <laughs> a flannel shirt, Varnay sunglasses. Oh, yeah, the Varnays. And, there you go. And I, I actually had hair back then, so my blonde hair is streaming out behind me, and I'm doing I'm cranking a real hard telemark turn around a gate, and you can plainly see I have a belt on that has a crested butte belt buckle on it. <laughs> and let me, Josh, to this day... I still wear that same belt with that same belt buckle really? on my Patagonia ski pants. Yes, oh, sir. That's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. But you ditched the blue jeans, I guess. That was uh, no blue jeans every day, huh? No, no. I, I, I left the blue jeans behind a few years ago. <laughs> I, love, I love that. That's like the, the Catalucci special right there, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I, there's a lot of pictures of me back in those days skiing uh, in blue jeans. You know, we, we'd wear gaiters. So you know the bottom of your blue jeans didn't get wet, but uh, I was too I was too poor. I was just a poor ski bum. I was too poor to buy expensive uh, ski pants. <laughs> oh man, that's what I love about that era too. And honestly, some of those pictures you sent are so cool because like some of the um, some of the, like you're talking about the tricks, but uh, there was one which is like an old like pole trick. Um, oh yeah, tip roll. Tip roll. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, that's an old school ski trick. That's a, yeah, yeah, that's Stein like an old Stein Erickson hot... used to do those. <laughs> oh, you're right. That is a Stein Erickson move. Oh, that's so yeah. funny. Yeah, because I was and, thinking it was more like a hot dogger kind of thing from the 70s, nah, but but yeah, it Stein was even before that. Yeah. 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 Oh I yeah, I had those. I had those down on skinny skis. I actually just got. Um, <laughs> I got his old book too, because and I think I. And I was reading that old old article you sent with that mentions Borkovec, and he he said that mm-hmm. that was one of the books he referenced 
too. Oh yeah. Where they saw, saw like Stein's dad doing a turn or something. And right. Man, that's so crazy just to think about all those books and just like how everyone's <laughs> kind of intertwined and in, in that I know. Whole. I know it's all related, you know? Did you guys ever, um, I guess with the, uh, one thing I noticed, like we were talking about traveling around with the racing, I, um, it looked like you went all the way out to Cable, Wisconsin, or something, to do a race. Yeah, yeah, they had a, <laughs> they they built it as the World Championship, the Telemark World Championships one year. Huh. And um, yeah, we went all the way up to Cable, up to the um, where they have the Berkabiner, um up at. Um, um, it's called. I, it, you know what's funny yeah. is it's it it was called Telemark Resort for a while. Oh, is that right? Yeah, and then it um, shut down, and now they're actually just this past month they were trying to um, get it back up and running because I think it closed oh, wow. down. So, well, I'm trying to remember the name of the actual resort itself, but um, uh, it escapes me at the moment. But yeah, they had a um, <clears throat> they had a big cross country um, weekend. Of course, that's that's mainly all they do there. They they've got a small alpine ski hill but it's very small but that's where they had the race and um i think i i think i took third place in that race my buddy clifton won it and a guy from denver named mark lance who was always one of the very top competitors um in telemark racing real nice guy he he got second and i got third we were sponsored by phoenix skis by that point so we were all i think we were all racing on phoenix skis that's so crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, did you so did any East Coast guys come out for that one? Cuz I always, that's what I w- always wonder is you had Dicky Hall on the East Coast and Yeah. But it it sounds like when we talked before it wasn't like there was a whole lot of crossover back then. No, that you know it it really hadn't um caught on quite as big in the East at that point. It did later. But um in fact, uh, the very first year after I moved back uh, back east from Crested Butte, I went up to West Virginia to snowshoe. They had uh, their southeastern telemark championships, and I hadn't even skied in a year. And I, I went up there and was fortunate enough to win their little event, and much to the their consternation <laughs> <laughs> like who's this guy, this guy sandbagging it <laughs> but uh ironically there were a couple of guys named calhoun up there who were also telemark uh good very good telemark skiers but um but anyway i digress uh yeah cable we went up to cable wisconsin for that race um and uh, yeah. Now, that, that's where we bought you've seen some some of the pictures uh of us racing um uh, in the skin suits um uh, um uh, after that and that we bought those on that trip oh my <laughs> at god the, at the lodge there where they have the berkabiner and all that uh we bought that they're actually crawled they were actually cross-country uh, racing suits but we thought those will those will work those great will work. for telemark <laughs> they, look, they look they look fast <laughs> they, yeah, and they were <laughs> that's so funny i mean if you skied slow wearing one of those suits you are you are a real turd yeah you're blowing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're you what a turkey man. Oh, man. you better be fast if you're wearing a suit like that <laughs> that's so funny I was actually just, I actually, funny, yeah, when I saw that in the article, Cable, I was like, oh, yeah, because I just, I was just out in, um, uh, the for the 30th annual Midwest Telly Fest. Yeah, I, I saw that where you went to that. How was that? It was, it was amazing, and it was crazy because it's kind of this convergence of, like, the Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan people, and they uh-huh. go up to this little area called the Porcupine State Park that's on the, um the edge of lake superior and it's up there man like i actually almost stayed in cable because i flew into minneapolis and, and oh that yeah it kind of got me thinking about that and then when i saw it in the article i was like oh man that's crazy that i mean you think yeah. like a world championship and they sent you to cable wisconsin you guys, <laughs> i know <laughs> so I know. that's, that's well, pretty funny so when when well i guess when did you guys stop racing then like by what year were you kind of wrapping that whole thing up? well i i raced until i left crested butte um uh, you know, I was still racing, and the racing scene was still going strong. I guess, you know, that race over in Snowmass, uh, 
which that was um, really the biggest race that there had been up to that point. Um, the race in cable was, was fun and all that. And, and, and there were a lot of people, a lot of spectators, but the race that they had in Snowmass, it was, they called it the North American uh, Telemark Championships. That was a big race. That race received a ton of media coverage. And there were like <laughs> literally hundreds <laughs> of spectators. Really? <laughs> not not thousands, but <laughs> there were a lot of spectators. The most spectators that had ever turned out for any telemark race. And it was a big deal. It was on one of their big race hills and, you know, with announcers and everything and a huge uh, 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 podium down at the bottom. And that was that was the big big race of that uh, 1982 season, and that one really brought out people from all over the place. There were people from Utah. There might have been some people from the East Coast there. Uh, I don't recall for sure, but everybody in Colorado that was interested in telemark racing was there, uh, and you know most of them participating. And um, um, we had qualifications on uh, Saturday. Um, there was, it was snowing and, uh, then the next day was bright sunshine, the race day. And, uh, I had a good day. I had a good day that day. You won. <laughs> did you win that one? I, I won that one. Oh, I did. That's amazing. And that was, uh, like Andy Warhol said, everybody has their 15 minutes of fame. Well, that was mine. <laughs> oh man. That's amazing. So that was 1982. <laughs> I believe that was 82, yeah, 82 or 83. I yeah. can't remember which. But, yeah, that was a big race, and that that uh, was the one that was um, uh, – that feature article in Cross Country Skier magazine was written about that race. And um, I started getting a lot of, a lot of press <laughs> after that race. Um, Crested Butte uh, – there were two, two little newspapers in Crested Butte at the time. They both wrote uh, – feature articles about me i think i sent you one from cataloochee to crested butte (laughs) and um uh so i got i got some notoriety actually more than 15 minutes of fame it was more like 35 minutes of fame so (laughs) that's so awesome i know and then this one from the post denver post which is charlie myers yeah yeah and i i I love seeing that because i see i lived in denver when i was a kid and um even before I started skiing. So it's cool to see like Denver post and, and the title uh-huh. title of that crested Buttes wild men are the <laughs> <Yeah>. toughest. <laughs> yeah. Well, the writer, Charlie, he was a little bit biased cause he lived in crested. Butte. Uh, <laughs> I love now. Yeah, nobody, nobody needs to know that. Yeah. <laughs> nobody needs to know that. Everybody knows it now, but, uh, uh, but uh, no, it, it was true though. I mean, we had the greatest concentration of hardcore telemark skiers anywhere in the world. I mean, and if anybody wants to argue with that, <laughs> come to Crested Butte, and I'll get a few of my buddies together, and we'll talk about that. <laughs> oh, no, for sure. Well, I even, in the mid night. so I, let's see, because I started telemarking like 90, 93, I, I, I mean, as funny as it sounds, like I was already hearing stories about Crested Butte even as a kid, and yeah. and to the and and actually what's funny and and i'm so glad that i grew up in a time that didn't have like widespread internet access Uh because i feel like it made the the mysteries a little more interesting because yeah what i knew about crested butte from an article in like a ski magazine was um by the 90s they you could show up and it said you could ski for free like in the early (laughs) part of the season and i was like no way this is this is insane (laughs) And sure enough, I used to, I, I drove out there. I was like 17, slept in my minivan in the parking lot <laughs> and, uh, they would just give you a free lift ticket, man. And you could just wow. go. Yeah. And and this was probably like 95, 96. And, uh, yeah. they had a whole week where you literally just walked up to the ticket office and they gave you a ticket and you, away you went. So oh, and, that's awesome. And I, and it was all because of. I heard telemarkers were so between there and tell you ride. There was like these little stories of, you know, kind of whisperings uh-huh. that you'd hear out in Utah, like, Oh, the guys are so tough out there, you know? So <laughs> that's funny. Well, we had some, we had some good skiers. I mean, there were, you know, I, I specialized in racing, but there were some really tough skiers there that, uh, you know, all that extreme terrain skiing that Crested Butte has now. Um, well, that was all there, of course, when, back in the day but we had to hike to get out to it 
And most of the time it was closed because the ski patrol didn't go out there and control it, you know? So yeah. every now and then we could talk one of our ski patrol friends into taking us out there and skiing that stuff. But now, nowadays, um, you know, you, you, you go out there and you'll see a few, you'll see some people telemarking that kind of terrain, but <clears throat> the most notable telemarker, that you'll see out there skiing that terrain still to this day is my buddy Don Cook, who is an amazing shredder on the super steep, gnarly ass slopes. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, gets it done, brother. You wouldn't believe you. You, I mean, I, now, I know you're a good skier too. I've seen your videos. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to get out there and ski around the beautiful. Oh of him. man. That would be so awesome. Yeah, I'll hook you up if you ever decide to go down there no, I to, to, to ski. I told Don that we were going to be talking, and he was pretty psyched about it. Oh, for sure. Um, but, uh, but you know, <clears throat> it, has, it has a tradition down there of, you know, people, you know, pretty hard, hardcore skiers skiing really gnarly stuff. And a lot of them still are doing it on Telemark skis. Um, uh, uh, I skied when I was out there this year. I skied that stuff. Uh, I was free. I was free heel skiing this year. I was injured in a car wreck on December 27th, and so I wasn't able to to do any telemarking because I just my ankle was uh, still healing up. healing, and I I couldn't. Uh, I just couldn't get into a telemark position. But I still ski my free heel skis. <laughs> oh, I love oh, that. all of that stuff. Uh, but, that's uh, that's a quick turnaround if you had to be out there in February. I mean, that's only like a well, little that's over right. a month. Um, so. I, it, was, um, it was dicey. I didn't even know if I was going to get to go, but I was bound and determined to go. And The first two weeks I was there, I was really only able to ski uh, groomers because um, my ankle just hurt too bad. But I kept nursing it along, uh, and uh, towards the <clears throat> last week and a half or so that I was there, I finally got out into the uh, outer limits and Got to ski all the stuff that I, that I normally love to ski, you know, the really steep stuff out in there. And uh, that's uh, that's that's my second home there, buddy. No, oh, I love that. Uh, it's so cool you still get out there and get to, like, go visit. And then there's, I mean, to think that there's all that history still there, like with Don. It absolutely is. Don skiing there still. and Oh, yeah. I mean, has... And many others, many others. Yeah, I mean, has a lot... I mean, when you go into, like, the downtown area it's not like a lot's changed i mean i guess it's more boutique than it used to be well, but well it's true i mean when you're in the downtown area um it doesn't seem all that much different um you know is there's a lot of sprawl that has happened the town is yeah. spread way out into what used to be just sagebrush fields when i lived there but um but it's still the character of the town is very very much the same as it was when i there the spirit of the people that live there in the town is is the same and um that's why it's literally it's my home away from home it's my second home in fact i was telling my wife the other day i got i probably have more friends in crested butte than i even have back here in north carolina that i've kept up with over the years um partly because crested butte's a a small closed in, you know, little community there. So the people that, you know, you see more often, but, um, but I've maintained uh, all these old friends over the years. And so every year when I go back, it's, it's like coming home. Yeah. Cause it, didn't you tend bar down there down in, Oh yeah. Yeah. Is, that, I, uh, is it still there? The bar that you used to work at? Well, y yeah, the building is, I, I, I bartended in the very early years of a restaurant, one of the most popular restaurants in Crested Butte called Donita's Cantina. Oh, dude. So Mexi is that... Have you been there? Oh, yeah. No, I have been there. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a Mex it was a Mexican restaurant. It started down in the old Elk Mountain Lodge, uh, which is an old building, um, big two-story building down um, on the, the corner of 2nd and Gothic. And... Um, the the original restaurant was there and i that's what that's where i bartended and um then in i bartended a whole bunch of places all over town uh, <laughs> I, too, too you... many too, too many to list but that was the main place and then they moved up to elk avenue which is main street um, a few years after i left and incidentally that place uh was owned um for most of those years by 
my friends, um, Kay Peterson Cook and her husband, Don Cook. Oh, wow. That's so yeah. crazy. I know. Yeah. I was I was thinking it because it's been a few years since I've been there, but I remember there's a, I thought maybe you were, you worked at that old bar that uh, uh, Butch Cassidy robbed or there was some, something. <laughs> I don't know. There's one at the end of town that, that I was Kachivers, thinking Kachivers, probably. Kachivers, yep. That's the yeah, one. That's the old-timers bar. <laughs> yeah. All the, all the old uh, uh, guys, the old-timers that were still alive when I lived there, they were all the old Cro- Croatian and Slavic miners that had came from the old country to mine uh, in Crested Butte. And, I mean, that's why the town is there. It was a mining town. And uh, so that was where they all hung out. Uh, they're pretty much all gone now. But, um, but it's still pr- kind of a hardcore local bar even to this day. <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've got some, uh, family history with, with old Butch Cassidy. So that's why I remember. Oh, that do one. you really? Yeah. Oh, awesome. that's what you get for growing up in Utah, man. It's like <laughs> <laughs> hole in the wall gang. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No. So that's, I remember going into that bar and I was like, oh, I guess, I guess I can belong here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're, you're qualified. <laughs> yeah. That's funny, man. So, so, so you're living back in, um, yeah, eventually lived, you, uh, you you moved back to north carolina in the mm-hmm. in the 80s or 90s or when yeah yeah in the mid 80s uh, uh a lot of reasons for the move uh uh none of which i shall divulge here but uh <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i've been back here ever since but um but never stopped skiing um still have a little ski area close to the house here in fact, they would still be open right now were it not for the coronavirus. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, you know, it's all man-made snow here now. I mean, we get natural snow, but not enough to run a ski area. Uh, they would still be open right now if, uh, if it weren't for the virus. But um, unfortunately, they're closed. But, you know, I've been skiing in the West include a, a lot over the years, including a, a lot of skiing in Utah. I love skiing in big and little cottonwood. And... Um, um, so next time I come to Utah, I got to get up with you. Yeah, we need to, we should do a little exchange, man. Cause I, uh, yeah. I've wanted to get out and ski beach and sugar and Catalucci sure. and, um, yeah, man. and I, I've, you know, I'll tell you the weirdest one back in that area that's on my list is Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Oh yeah. Gatlinburg. Do you talk about tiny ski area? Yeah. You know, that one, that one, I just want to kind of like. Yeah. Oh, I just want to say I skied in Tennessee, man. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the only ski area in Tennessee for sure. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, Josh, you'd be surprised how many people still telemark ski at Catalucci here. Yeah, and I'm sure. I'm sure there's some still up at Beach and Sugar. I never go up there because uh, it, you know two and a half hour drive from here. Oh, I drive it's that far from ski you. Right here. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. So. So I, I just ski right here. No, and, I know, uh, but, I know. There's a little crew up there. You know, I've I've been in touch with with some people from Beach. Um, they had a little Telemark festival. Um, oh yeah. I'm not sure. It's been a few years since I've heard from anybody. So, hopefully, if anybody's listening from Beach or Sugar or Catalucci, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let absolutely. us let us know how the North North Carolina Telemark uh, scene is yeah. going. Hopefully yeah, next year, man. That's kind of crazy right now with the whole coronavirus thing. Right. Right. But well, it's not going to, that's not going to last forever. And we will get back to, to skiing one of these days. And, um, I mean, it seems kind of a trivial thing right now with all that going on, but, um, uh, but you know, got to maintain perspective. Totally. Yeah, man. What a cool story. I, uh, I'm so glad that we got to talk about all this stuff, man. And it's, uh, it opened, I, it's like I said, when I first called you, it's like it, it opens up this whole other can of worms. Cause there's like all these different names and now yeah. I got all sorts of other questions. Maybe we'll have to do a little follow up one and get Don old Don cook on here. And oh, yeah, you, guys absolutely. Can, <laughs> you guys can <laughs> get deep on some stuff, but, um, yeah, for sure. Um, well, it's, it's real pleasure to talk to you because, um, you know, I've been thinking about all this. I've got all this history, you know, that, you know, most people that know me around here, they don't have any idea of this history that I have. And, um, you know, people out there do, but not all that many people, even in Crested Butte, only my old friends remember those days. You know, there's a whole new influx of people there now that could care less about that. So when I heard about you and your interest in the history of, of telemark skiing, I thought, man, I need to contact that guy. And I thought about it for about a month before I finally uh, – mate reached out to you you know because i thought wow who you know 
who'd want to hear my story, you know, but but uh, it's a pretty good story, I think. <laughs> oh no, it's it's amazing, man. And I, I mean, you know, even just talking boots and uh, how you guys were thinking about stuff. And I think I think one thing that's really important about our conversation today is, and, and I hope people realize this, is Telemark has really developed not just through backcountry skiers, but I mean, yours was a lot about racing, a lot about inbound skiing too, on top of yeah. you know hiking around, but. Um, you know, and that's kind of how I was. And I think it's funny. A lot of people think that every telemark skier in the nineties and, you know, eighties, seventies, whatever mm -hmm. was just a backcountry skier. And I actually, yeah. even though I was reading Steve Barnett's book, I taught myself mm -hmm. how to ski in a resort. So, yeah, yeah, that, that I'd say, well, you know, once, once <clears throat> you mentioned I was part of the second wave, well, by the time the second wave, uh, was kind of getting going, um, it was pretty much all about skiing at the area. Yeah, I mean, you know, people were people were skiing the backcountry still too a lot, but uh, but you know, most people it was a lot easier to learn at the area, and um, a lot of people just. But now, you know, having said that, Crested Butte is not just your average ski area. There's terrain there that <laughs> you oh, know yeah. that is uh, extremely challenging. So your average resort telemarker. Uh, is probably a little higher quality at uh, Crested Butte than elsewhere. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that terrain is no joke, especially if you're willing to, you know, walk around a little bit or get yeah. into well, the, the yeah. back Yeah, nowadays you don't have to walk so much. I mean, the yeah, there's little T-bars everywhere, you know, like <laughs> yeah, you can get out yeah. to, a, yeah, out, you were mentioning outer limits and all, all that kind of stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. there's some... Uh, some pretty serious skiing there, man. I mean, it's not, you got that right. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's not, serious. Just, not just groomers and stuff, but I mean, oh, you, it's, it's, it's deadly serious terrain. Yeah. yeah. No, it makes sense that like really like the early and, and like you said, like later on in the, in the nineties, you know, that's like where the extreme skiing competition started and Absolutely. You know, a lot of that kind of stuff. So, yep. Yeah. That's pretty wild to think about how much history of, of, skiing and telemarketing all sorts of stuff has kind of come out of that area there well, there's so much more i could tell you about too you know i mean we're limit we have a time limit but uh there's uh you know i could go on and on and on <laughs> no i love that well i'm sure i'm dude i'm sure we'll have you back on too because i think as i'm piecing more of this together i mean i'm i'm just grateful that you reached out and it kind of gives me an opportunity to ask questions that I've wondered forever, you know, like, yeah. I mean, yeah, even, even little stuff with like the, the pickle barrels. I mean, it's funny. <laughs> I mean, all of us at the shop, we talk about the pickle barrel thing <laughs> constantly, but it's, it's not like we know where it came from, you know? Yeah. And so to just, well, now, just, now you know, <laughs> yeah, it came from the cantina, the back of the cantina, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I got to mention one other guy's name. Yeah, please uh, do. Is a good friend of mine who was heavily involved in the telemark racing scene back then. Great backcountry skier. Um, and I had not seen him for years, and I was reunited with him just this year. We got one fabulous afternoon of skiing together. His name is Dave Schieffer, and um, he lives down in Gunnison, and he's lived in Gunnison County for the past uh, probably about 45 years. Just a super terrific guy, and um, he was, uh, you know, I couldn't, I mentioned so many people. I just want to make sure I mentioned Dave, too, because he was one of he was one of those pioneers back in the day too. Yeah, I love that man. It's so cool, and I love that you know all these names and and can reference them. And I I know I'm grateful for like all these people. I know you guys were it, probably not thinking like, hey, we're changing the world, but honestly, <laughs> it, it, I mean, well, uh, it, it really it, those things really did influence how telemark kept going and i've always said it's mm -hmm. like these little pieces and little groups of people that have really kept telemark kind of rolling through the years yeah. and uh collectively it's you know it's really made a difference so yeah you you don't know how bad it pisses me off to hear somebody on the chairlift say well i, I i'm hearing telemarking is dead dude 
what, what, you must have been talking to people that only market AT gear now because they don't want to sell Telemark gear because AT gear is more expensive. You know, telemarking it, dude, is not dead. All you got to do is come to Crested Butte. Hell, even come to Catalucci. <laughs> yeah. see people telemarking, you know? <laughs> see, I love that, man. Um, and that's that's it, yeah. right? Like, yeah, you could even go to Catalucci and you're not going to think that, you yeah. know? And that I love hearing. <laughs> One 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 more thing I want to mention, yeah, brother, Josh. Go for it. I didn't talk about. I, I talked to. My, there were a few women that I talked about that were members of the Ski to Die Club. Oh yeah. Um, but I want to mention a couple of other um, ladies um, who uh, who were very instrumental and great telemark skiers back in the day. Uh, one is my still uh, my very dear friend Jill Barr. Uh, she she was an early telemarker and. Uh, 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 ironically, I still have a pair of her old Kazamas down in my basement, and <laughs> <laughs> she was a terrific telemark skier And uh, back in the day. And another gal named Julie Neals, who was a former Alpine racer, who was also a badass telemark racer. And um, so I just want to give a little shout out to the women there uh, as well. You know, because and Katie Pytel, who who won the uh, North American Telemark Championship uh, for the women, um, and uh, she's another one that deserves a shout out. Man, that's so cool, man! Thanks for doing that. And that, that I mean, I yeah, I think what's so important about having these conversations is just like documenting, you know, and and that's yeah. for me the history. I'm so glad that we're finally having the chance to like document some of these stories and like what what happened because yep. <laughs> it's just yep. <laughs> it's phenomenal like when we talk about it and it I think the other thing that's really striking to me, you know, is is just the the sense of community. Like you're still friends with all these people and I think <laughs> yeah, of all the I friendships am. that you know, I always hear that with the telemark world is like we're all a family, you know, and I mm-hmm. think this even this even goes a level deeper where it's like different generations of friendships have been made all because of telemark skiing. Whether oh, yeah. whether people still do it or not, like the friendships were forged, you know, during that that time period when people Absolutely. were doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, love that. That's, that's really special. And that's what that's one of the that's really probably the main thing that keeps me going back to Crested Butte every year is not just the awesome skiing, but just my friends. Yeah, I love that, man. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, let's uh, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate the conversation and uh, my pleasure. Glad we could record it Um, for for all the people that are listening out there. um, Thanks for checking this out. Uh, As always, how you can support us um, if you buy your telemark gear. Uh, go check out our shop at freeheellife.com. Uh, articles you can read on telemarkskier.com. And you can always email me at podcast at freeheellife.com. And thanks for listening. And please take a second to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And until next time, spread telemark always, my friends. <laughs>